That this is a sense of localism. It's the people associated to a specific world. My name is Jill Gracie, and on behalf of Wireless Voice, it's my privilege to welcome you all to this event. Power to the people, local to the wire outside. We have the three very special guests with us tonight Dr. Oliver Hartwick, Dr. David Brogenhanger, and Malcolm Alexander. Welcome to Power to the Please put our guests around the floor. Now, for a little bit of health and safety in the event of a fire, please note that the exit's closest to you and the emergency can um, east of this building and in the event of an earthquake, drop, cover and hold. So, why is Wairapa Voice organised this event tonight? Wairapa Voice successfully challenged the centralisation of local government services by stealth with the rejection of the Wellington Super City way back in 2000. We feel it has contributed to communities losing people, losing their trust. Thank you. 
we can speak and study by speakers and um, our lives are brought together. So now I'm going to go on now and speak our guest speaker. So I do actually want to, because I don't have a few friends with you, and I acknowledge the people who say, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be here. To recap for those who may not have been from the background detail uh, over the weeks that have gone by, where there's been a certain amount of publicity, um, our three gifts. Thank you. 
Bureaucracies to make them on our behalf. So, what is localism then? Localism is an idea that stands in a rich intellectual philosophical tradition going back centuries. It is nothing new, it is nothing that we at the New Zealand Initiative have dreamt up in the last few years, even though it has been campaigning for the last six years. It has been something that's really deeply rooted in the Western philosophy.
common good. One of the criticisms I have seen thrown back at New Zealand Minister is that the Euro is supported by some of uh, an extreme right wing lobby group. Uh, extreme right wing right wing lobby group should be talking about localism as being the best way for decentralisation and quote for the sake of the common good. I think that's um, nicely put that criticism in the place where it belongs. I think the uh, the other one, and we've often used, explained this principle in a different way, community of a higher order should not interfere with the community of the lower order. I always talk about what are the best, the best solutions come from the ground, and the very people to live, eat, and breathe the situation is interesting, and we have grown up in this area and know precisely and intimately what the kind of climate is geographic and economic influences are for the state of being there, or five, six, and in the group in this case, eight generations. In my case, I've been in the group in the one country. Um, Thank you. 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 Uh, Dr. David Bogostana. Um, I have sat come from me uh, very, very well over the last few months in particular with our interactions in Wellington. But uh, Dr. Bogostana is uh, the ambassador for the Australian ambassador, the chief ambassador to New Zealand and the Cook Islands, the Australian Fugees, the Amor, the Tonga, the Bali, and the Ocean 2014. He started his career in the Swiss Army and joined the Swiss Confederation of Diplomatic Service in 1987. Um, most recently, I've had the privilege of um, attending a meeting once by ceremony with um, Dr. David Sanger at Kukiyadi, where we have the pleasure of hosting the Swiss Army Band in what is just two. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really warm and honored to welcome to the director of the doctor, Dr. Robinson. What we are discussing tonight, and there are of course different opinions are all legitimate. If we were not safe, safety was the base of it all. So thank you, Ron, for doing a great job for New Zealand. I had a, or the Swiss Embassy had a phone call a few days ago, and somebody called and was complaining bitterly that the Swiss ambassador was going to give a right-wing speech tonight. Now, I wonder how you can complain before you've even heard the speech. But uh, I want to reassure you, I'm not going to give a right-wing speech because I don't think that the issue that we are debating tonight is an issue of left or right. Uh, when you talk about left or right, it's about how the public wealth is distributed in a society. That's the basic question, the basic difference between left and right, and uh, I'm not getting into that tonight, and uh, far from me uh, to, uh, to uh, interfere in, uh, in, a national, in a national debate in New Zealand that is healthy, that is taking place in every country, that is also taking place in my country. We are not talking about an issue of left or right tonight. We are talking about an issue of common sense. Now, we just heard a very 
convincing presentation about localism by my friend Oliver Hartwick with, uh, with an impressive uh, historical and economical background. I don't, and actually I hear that word quite often here in New Zealand. Uh, I had a few days ago a discussion with the leader of the opposition, Simon Bridges, about localism. But I must say I've never heard that localism before I came to New Zealand. Uh, we don't talk about localism. We simply live it in my country. It's, a, it's an unknown word. Uh, our country, Ron just mentioned, uh, uh, bottom up, our country has been built bottom up for 724 years. We started doing that when the first Maori just started to settle in New Zealand. And our country uh, grew from small to not so small to the eight and a half million uh, that Oliver just mentioned. <coughs> and uh, nowadays we are still a small country if you look at our surface, but we have almost twice as many people as New Zealand. Uh, and you could say that when it comes to economic power, we are among the mid sized economies, not among smallest economies. We are actually the, uh, I think, number 19 in the economies of the world. Now, I said we live localism. Switzerland uh, is a confederation of 26 little republics. And I say republics, and some of them even call themselves republics. To this day, we call them cantons in our constitution. Twenty-six cantons, each of those cantons has its own constitution, has its own parliament, and has its own elected government. And each of these cantons sets its own taxes. And actually, the major taxes that you pay are talking about direct taxes. We have also a modest uh, GST, that is, of course, a tax that goes to the federal government. We don't have a central government, we have a federal government. But the 26 cantons, they all have their own Ministry of Finance, they all have their own direct tax revenue. And then, and now I'm coming to the important point, we have 2,255 that we would call councils, 2,255 in a country with a population less than twice the population of New Zealand. I believe New Zealand has 78. And these 2,255 local communities all are autonomous in their finances. They raise direct taxes, not rates, taxes, income taxes. And they are among themselves in competition, which I think is a very healthy thing. And I give you the example that I know best of my own very small hometown, my own canton of Zurich, which is the largest canton in Switzerland, 1.3 million, 1.4 million inhabitants <coughs> and also our economic center and how it works. My own town has about 1,200 people, residents. Uh, it's not among the absolutely smallest, but it's among the smaller communities in that canton. That canton has 167 local communities, 1.4 million a canton of 1.4 million people. Each of these co communities sets their own taxes. If it's a large town, like the city of Zurich, for example, 400,000 people, uh, there is a parliament that sets the taxes, but the citizens can appeal in a referendum against the decision of the parliament. In most of these 167 communities, it's an assembly like yours tonight that sets the tax rates every year. The 
mayor or the council makes a proposal, has to defend that proposal uh, in front of the citizens, and then the citizens vote yes or no. And anybody in that assembly says, no, we don't like your proposal, we want five points less. And uh, whoever gets a majority in that assembly wins. I said, Canton of Zurich, 167 uh, local communities. Now, how do we pay taxes? I said, there is a GST that goes to the federal government. The federal government has to run an army, has to run a diplomatic service, has to do a lot of things like uh, uh, scientific research, uh, uh, health prevention, and so on. There is money needed at the federal level, but whatever the Constitution does not uh, give as a responsibility in a constitutional article to the federal government remains the responsibility of the candidates. For example, police, for example, education, these are issues that are the responsibility of the cantons and not of the federal government. Now, coming back to the taxes, uh, 100. Um, okay, GSD goes to the goes to the federal government. There is also a modest direct tax that goes to the federal government, uh, but it's among the three taxes that I'm going to present to you, it's by far the smallest one. So, uh, I pay some income tax to the federal government, and then I pay what we call the state tax, that is the income tax that goes to the canton, to the little republic, and then, and let's say we call that 100%. I mean, in, in each canton it's different, but in one canton, uh, the canton, the cantonal parliament sets the tax rate, and that is 100%. And now, in my example, my home canton of Zurich, I looked it up this morning. The lowest tax that a local community raises is 72, was in 2017, 72% of the cantonal tax, of the state tax, as we call it. The highest one is 131%. So you have quite a spread here. And what does that mean? It means, first of all, if you're a crazy spender, uh, you're lost, because you have to raise your taxes so high and even if the citizens support you, you will lose the businesses. They will simply move away. Uh, that's competition. Competition uh, creates discipline. Because if you know it's risky to raise taxes, you're very hesitant to do it. Secondly, uh, it means that the citizens benefit because overall they pay less taxes. Now, you could say, is it fair that people in one place have to pay 130% and in another place they have to pay 70%? Now, there are, of course, other reasons than just crazy, reckless spending why you have these differences. It can simply be that in one place uh, the costs are so high, for example, because the place is high up in the mountains, and it costs a lot to remove the snow in winter. I mean, that is a, an example that everybody understands. Or there is no work uh, in a certain place. There are, there are no employers. There are no companies. Or you have more welfare cases. Or you have more asylum seekers. These are all things that are important. Or uh, you are a big city that runs an opera house or a theater and the whole region comes to the city. I'm sure Celia Waitbrand knows that issue very well. And you have the costs while all the others can come and, uh, and enjoy uh, these, these cultural uh, 
benefits. And for that, we have a mechanism uh, that is called financial per equation. So if a, if a certain uh, community is too far up in the, in the tax rate for good reasons and not because of reckless spending, or another one is too far down and uh, people pay very little in taxes, then they have to help each other. There is a law for that. The rich give something and the rich communities give something. The poorest communities receive something. The same also at the fe federal level exists uh, between the cantons. So this is the financial aspect. I believe that having competition is always a healthy thing. Uh, and it forces those who have the political responsibility uh, to think twice before they, before they spend. But there is other issues at stake than, than finances. Um, I observed, of course, the amalgamation discussion in the Wellington region that happened during my time, the Auckland amalgamation was already decided when I came to New Zealand. And as a Swiss, uh, I mean, I observed it, I didn't get involved in it uh, as a foreigner, but uh, sometimes I shook my head because all the arguments that have been used in this uh, discussion were arguments that simply wouldn't carry water in my country because people know that first of all, even even the advocates of, you know, we had in Switzerland we had twenty years ago we had still three thousand local communities. Now it's two thousand two hundred fifty, and we had some extreme cases. I mean, we had local communities with thirty people, fifty people, eighty people, a hundred and twenty people. They struggled to even find a mayor and councillors. Uh, it was reasonable to, to uh, have amalgamation in certain places, and it has been done. I think we are now more or less at the end of this process, and uh, I believe that the number will s remain stable now around more or less 2,000 councils, probably rather more than 2,000. Uh, so there can be an argument for amalgamation but there have been some attempts also uh, in my country to create bigger cities, and they always use the argument it's, you know, uh, economies of scale. Uh, we can do it together. It will cost less. Uh, the taxes will be, uh, will, will be lowered afterwards. The opposite is true. The opposite has happened in every single case, and now even the advocates of amalgamation. Uh, I just read an interesting article by one of the main proponents, proponents and he said, uh, I have to admit now after 20 years experience, the argument of saving costs is totally wrong. It doesn't happen. You don't save costs. Why? Because first of all, bigger entities tend to be less responsible. Uh, smaller entities, you know, when the mayor has to justify in front of the citizens every day what uh, is being spent, what is being built, what is necessary, what may not be necessary, uh, the mayor or the councillors or whoever is in charge uh, will become very careful. They are closer to the people. They are part of the people. The, uh, the, the mayor in a small town or a small district like yours is a citizen like any other citizen. Secondly, uh, it is always, uh, uh, the argument has always been used that, uh, you know, uh, civil servants, they know how to do these things. I mean, they have a bigger experience. They do it more rationally and so on. No, 
they don't because they're farther away from the people. And uh, uh, what I observe in my country is that when there is amalgamation, uh, you lose a lot of the resources that have been free because, you know, in a small town like mine, the mayor, uh, I know that because I ran myself, ma myself for that office a few months ago from, <laughs> from Wellington, which was a bit reckless, and uh, uh, I got the majority, but it was not the absolute majority. I had 13 votes missing, otherwise I probably wouldn't be standing here tonight. Uh, and uh, my opponent didn't me the favor, uh, didn't do me the favor, which I hoped he would, uh, and advocate amalgamation, because if he had, I would have won in a landslide. But um, the election before, when a friend of mine got elected mayor, uh, he had an opponent who was uh, in favor of amalgamation, and it was a, was a suing for him. Anyway, uh, what you lose is all these people who work for free. I mean, in a small town like mine, you have, uh, except the village administrator and the tax secretary and two or three other people, nobody is paid. I mean, people do that in their free time, they do it in the evening, and they do it as professionally uh, as paid civil servants and all that you lose. As soon as it's bigger, nobody will do volunteer work like that anymore. Because then, of course, once you have 10,000 people or, or, or 50,000 people, I mean, then it becomes an administration and uh, then uh, people uh, will say, well, we have civil servants to do the job and the distance between the authorities and the uh, and the citizens becomes bigger. Now let me say something what citizenship means in my country, and that may surprise you. I'm not a citizen of Switzerland. Uh, I'm the Swiss ambassador, but I'm the citizen of a local community, and that gives me citizenship rights at the cantonal level and at the federal level. But I should have brought you my passport. My passport does not say he is a citizen of Switzerland. My passport says he is a citizen of Koppel and he is a citizen uh, of the canton of Zurich and therefore he is a citizen of Switzerland. And if you are a foreigner who applies for citizenship, you first have to be accepted by your local community and once that is done, you get citizenship by the canton and finally you get federal citizenship. So citizenship is for us something deep rooted in the local political body, the platoon uh, that we heard before. And uh, with this I want to conclude my remarks because I'm sure that you will have questions afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for fighting in something that I believe is good for New Zealand. New Zealand is a wonderful country and you are a fantastic democracy. Uh, you sometimes have a debate in New Zealand about, you know, colonialism and that sort of thing. I believe that <coughs> the British have left in New Zealand a lot of good things. They have left the rule of law, they have left uh, the rights of the indi individual citizen, they have left the idea that everybody should be equal before the law, uh, they have left together with the American and the French Revolution the idea of human rights and all this is a wonderful heritage and uh, should not be should not be regarded upon as something bad. I mean, you had a debate a couple of years ago about the Union Jack in your flag. The Union Jack in your flag, uh, or in any flag, may be a colonial relic when you're an African country, but not when you're New Zealand that has fought for freedom 
and human rights in two world wars and other wars under that flag. So I could never understand, understand that debate. But there is one really colonial relic in New Zealand, and that colonial relic is centralism, and I don't think you need it, and I don't think you should have it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I think there's uh, quite a number of takeaways in that, and I think I could see my cousin, my Fanonga Rawuri, uh, sitting there nodding at the concept of uh, having a passport for Carterton, and everyone here being uh, uh, becoming a citizen of uh, Hurunui Rangi or something of that nature. So I got that right, Rawuri. A bit of a takeaway, but I guess um, there'd be resonate, there'd be strong uh, resonance in this room for much of that commentary. Uh, Excellency, because I think the, the issues that our current mayors and former mayors have always grappled with is the issue of how do you raise revenue, how do you do it in a way that befits your local community. And of course, everyone goes through their annual budget, their round of consultations when it comes time for the annual plan, and everyone, uh, and it is even today, you still hear that generally people would like to have that greater say in the final setting of that, of course. New Zealand. I think our next speaker, probably uh, as a chief executive of local government New Zealand, and a man who is in contact with all um, local government, mayors, councillors and CEOs throughout New Zealand, understands very deeply uh, the issues and the challenges and the constraints that come with the current Local Government Act, which constrain how councils can raise revenue. Imagine if you would, if you had the ability to lay down your own economic policy and determine for yourself how you would raise revenue and thereby what you would prioritise and, and how you would do that. The mind does open up somewhat, Your Excellency, and thank you very much. So uh, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, as I've already alluded to, um, the CEO of Local Government New Zealand, a very good friend, someone I got to know very well in my time as the Mayor of Garderton. There was a breath of fresh air when he came into local government. He came in from the corporate sector of being general manager uh, for Genesis Energy, had a new way of looking at things, uh, a better understanding of how MMP works for a start and how he could best represent uh, the institution of local government New Zealand ladies and gentlemen to speak on uh, local government's focus on local uh, localism, please give a hearty water up a welcome to Malcolm Alexander. Uh, good evening everyone. Um, uh, first of all, let me acknowledge on the war wrong mark, Mayor John Booth, former Mayor Sally Wade Brown, uh, Brown uh, the other elected members in the room, but more importantly you the people, because you elected, that makes you the boss. And that's what democracy is about. Now, I just wanted to explain something because I've been tipped uh, by Jill. Local Government New Zealand is not the Local Government Commission. I quite like their budget, but we don't run amalgamations and that. In fact, that my job uh, is to look out for the membership of councils across the country. So rather than being an adjunct government, I tend to aggravate them a lot from time to time, but I'm okay with that. The point is what we're trying to do is put power back into the hands of councils power back into the hands of you, the people at a local level, it's about local democracy. And, and let me start by therefore saying what our vision is as an organisation is, and it's this, it's very short and it's very simple. Local democracy, powering community and national success. So that vision, short and sweet, but it reflects our abiding belief that for democracy to remain vibrant in our country, must be grounded in the communities that make up New Zealand. It says also that the concept of local democracy on one hand and the concept of efficiency and effectiveness, as it's often phrased, are not mutually exclusive. The f they can coexist, and the fact that Switzerland does it shows it can be done. But there is a theme in New Zealand these days that somehow local is bad and central is good that somehow local communities do not know what is in their best interests and do not know how to run their affairs, so we'd better run it for them. So we don't hold with that. But it's true to say, ladies and gentlemen, 
that our system today is actually designed to constrain the role and the functionality of local government in New Zealand, which, is, as the Ambassador said, is actually quite consistent with our history. And it goes right back to the 19th century when almost the first thing that was done was to abolish the provinces. Let's get rid of local control. Cantons, as you perhaps could have thought about them then, they, they barely got going and they were eliminated. And the power came back to Wellington. And this theme continues the day with this constant drive to amalgamate, to aggregate. It's, it's there all the time. Local government is a creature of statute, and that therefore what we do is actually delimited by law. In other words, what central government chooses to let local government do. And, that, and what we're allowed to do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is very constrained relative to other jurisdictions when you look around the world. And it goes more beyond functions. It even goes to things like process. So I was actually surprised to find that we had a statute when I joined local government that tells local government how it should run a meeting, as though we're incapable of working that out for ourselves. But I don't recall ever seeing a statute called how to run a cabinet meeting statute, but apparently you need one. In fact, the system is so constrained and process-driven that it's become slow, costly, and in many respects depowering of community wants and needs. On top of that, the local government funding regime, by re re uh, relying primarily on property tax, which is what it rate is, sets up a regime where what local government is able to do is constrained by its ability to raise funds from people who happen to be asset rich but are income poor. You can't eat a house. It might go up, but that doesn't mean your income goes up. So when rates go up, something's got to give. It's a system designed to create pressure. It's, and it's reaching its use-by date. We therefore need to rethink about how this whole system works because it's inhibiting the growth of our country. It's actually undermining the vitality and the vibrancy of our local democracy. So we are thinking about how we go about it. But I would say, having made those comments, that all those things are a choice. We choose to accept that. We choose to think that this is the way it must be, because it's always been. But it's a choice, ladies and gentlemen. And in that choice, invariably, as, we, as the pressure goes on to be better and more efficient, the apparent answer to every problem is to aggregate, to amalgamate, to get bigger. Bigger is best, goes that line of argument. And on that analysis, one day we end up with one council for all New Zealand because if that's the biggest, it must be the best. The result is that a community's representatives get further and further away from their constituents. And that is not a way to nurture democracy, particularly in a country without a written constitution that could be there to protect our basic liberties. We could wake up tomorrow find a parliament passed an act and eliminating that. That's the way it is. We hope that doesn't happen and we trust people like Ron not to let it happen. But it could. So we see a drive to localism as a way of starting to deal with some of those really entrenched problems, both in terms of our community engagement, our democracy, but also dealing with things about how do we deliver better services to our, co our community. Um, but at the end of the day, a call for localism, a call for a move in a direction for uh, along the way towards Switzerland, and I'll come to that in a minute, it can only succeed if the people agree. It can't be imposed from the top. It has to be brought into from the people at the bottom. Ron made the point. It's bottom up, not top down. If it's not that, it won't work, and it's got no value to add. So we, together with our partner at the New Zealand Initiative, have started this project what we called the Localism Project, we launched a couple of weeks ago in, in, at our conference in Christchurch, in order to start a conversation, to use that overused phrase, but a, a, a series of work to understand what could an improved localism system look like for New Zealand, because what works for New Zealand will be what works for New Zealand, not Switzerland or Canada or US or 
anywhere else. It has to be Kiwi. And most importantly, what could a revised system look like and add value to New Zealanders? Because if it's not adding value, it's probably not worth doing. And I do pick up the ambassador and Oliver's point that where we start in that discussion, where we start in that project, is at the extreme. We are out here. Switzerland is out here, and just about everybody else is in here. So if our aspiration was simply to be ordinary, we'd still get a 30% gain by moving to the average. Just being ordinary. So right now, as Oliver said, about 88, 89% of all public expenditure in New Zealand is spent by central government. In Switzerland, it's 13%. In the OECD average, which is the club we're a member of, first world democracies, it's 46. 46 is the average, we're at 88. So if we want more centralisation, we've got 12% of headroom, and then what do we do? So it's time to start to recalibrate that relationship in our, in our view. But, and here's the kicker, ladies and gentlemen, if we do that, if we start to think about doing things in a different way, if we start to think about how we bring that down to make things more meaningful, we've got to understand that with greater responsibility comes greater accountability. There's no such thing as a free lunch in the real world. If you're going to want to do things more at a local level, you've got to stand up and be counted and be acceptable and be accountable, sorry, for the outcomes that flows from that. No, that's Wellington's problem, or I didn't really mean that, it's Wellington's problem. There's no, you're in it, this is it. We take accountability and we do it and we stand up and accept that. So that's the critical thing. Um, and with that um, is the issue that we have to confront as we go through uh, this process, if we determine whether this can add value, is how in fact do we raise the quality of decision making and the quality of outcomes locally, because it doesn't happen by accident. Okay, so that's part of it. So in that part, we go, I go to Oliver's first point. It's actually about incentives. And I'm an incentives guy. I'm a lawyer, not an economist. But that quote that Oliver put up pretty much sums it up. I often say to policy people in Wellington as they try to tell us what to do, um, if you don't like what is going on. Examine why that is happening, why people behave that way, and then change the incentives that make them behave that way. That's, how, that's called human nature. So one of the reasons you get nimbyism in Auckland around housing growth is because you're asking incumbents to take a loss on their property value to do the right thing. But that does, it doesn't work that way. You're asking them to take a financial hit in their family on the off chance we might address housing affordability. There are actually other ways to address housing affordability. Oliver showed you on his graph. It's about making sure that benefits go local, not costs. But right now, costs go local and benefits go central. So, um, I'll give you an example of how that plays out in the tourism industry. In Queenstown, it's our biggest tourism market. We have millions of visitor nights there today. How many ratepayers do you think are in Queenstown? It's only actually about just a little bit over 20,000 ratepayers. Those ratepayers are asked to pay for all the entire infrastructure that these millions of other people use. And isn't that fantastic for those guys? Hey, what, a, what a thing that they're doing for the good of the country. But actually, they're a bit fed up with it. And what we're saying is we should have a local visitor levy, based on bed nights probably, which allows the users at a modest cost of $10 or something like that to help contribute to the costs of the services and facilities they use. We don't think that's unreasonable. And we think Queenstown District Council should have the right to levy that, in, that, that levy. That's localism. And that council can choose to make it $1 or $2, it might be a cap. But the point is, they don't have to use what I call the Oliver Twist funding model. Please, government, can I have some more? That's what we have to do. We have to go and ask for a grant and that, and if we're really nice, government might give it to us. How about putting the power back in the local hands to decide what they want and what they need, provided they deliver value, which is the accountability point. So that's at a, at a local level what it might mean. One of the things we're looking at is what is the functionality between central and local government? How might that play out? 
a number of our members have already said, well, let's have a look at social policy. You know, a few years ago, the previous government did a thing called social um, sector trials where they tried to devolve down the delivery of services at a local level, because guess what? It, it, it turns out local communities know what the issues are at a local level around social issues and have a better place to target the intervention and do things, and it worked fine, and then they stopped. Didn't do it. Stop then. We're back to the central thing. And maybe there's a role for social service delivery to be done locally because locals know the issues, they know the people, and they probably know what would work best. Could be that. In Switzerland, one of the things we learned on the trip there was about vocational education. There, the local councils work with their local businesses and they train young people for about 14. You get a choice of academic or vocational, both are equally treated as valid. You join a skills, you work with a business, you, can, you become a chippy and a, a sparky and that. And guess what? There's not a skill shortage in Switzerland. But we have 100,000 kids not in education um, or training. Is that a good system? Would we be better? And maybe you know better about what works for the kids in your community, about how to bring them forward rather than a nationally imposed curriculum in every respect. It will need to be a curriculum, so it's a balance, but we need flexibility to allow for local solutions to come forward. Well, at least that's the argument we're putting forward for debate. Um, so for LGNZ and the members of LGNZ who have mandated us to start this project, to have a think about what might be. We ask what could because we know in many jurisdictions overseas that could be for New Zealand is the reality for them. They're doing it. We're not. As I said, it's a choice. We choose not to do it. We don't have to. The benefits of this for us, not only are they growing economies, growing education opportunities, better social delivery, what have you, but at the end of the day, by putting the people back in charge by putting the people closest to where the decisions are made for them that work best. It's about reinvigorating our democracy, about delivering better value and outcomes. We'll get more people to vote and participate in local government because it will be clearly seen as mattering. It will matter. What they do will matter. So I'll participate because I'm interested in the outcome. I think it's true to say that if things don't matter, then people don't care. So let's see if we can fix that. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's the discussion we're going to have with the people of New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And I've just uh, had a little bit of a nod and gather the time is moving on, so I'm going to cut short with the summation. That, I suffice to say, that should have given us all food for some clear thinking outside of convention. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I want to introduce to you your next speaker, Ron Shaw. Ron is spokesperson for the Wairarapa, for Wairarapa Voice, uh, who is going to tell us what next for the Wairarapa. I just going to say, Ron was a candidate in the last local body elections, wasn't successful, but like all people who are passionate and committed to the well-being of the community, Ron continues to box on, and in this case, in his role with White Rapid Force. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ron Shaw. Okay. I'm going to save you some time and boredom. I'm not going to say anything except to give you a chance to ask some questions. In terms of what is happening going forward, when you get out into the foyer, there's an opportunity to put your details down so we can get in touch with you if you want to be involved. But really, if we can give a chance for someone on the floor to ask some questions, I'm prepared to give up my slot to where you go. Okay, thanks, Ron. Um, we've been given some questions already, and if anybody's written a question so far, can you please um, wave your hand and then uh, some of the wire rapper voice volunteers will come and grab them? We'll try and collect those as quickly as we can. All right, so the uh, question we've got here is, so we've had an issue, obviously, in Wairarapa recently about transparency and uh, the conduct of council meetings as opposed to workshops. Uh, so there's a question for any of the panel. 
how would the, the model of localism address Wairapa's voters' issues with lack of transparency? But there's also the case that from time to time as councils are going through for decisions, oh, as time to time as councils are going through decisions, there will be a need to discuss things at a confidential level. Sometimes that's just the way it is. A good example might be you're thinking of doing tendering a, a, a new wastewater plant, for example. You want to talk about the, the conditions of the contract. The last thing you want to do is tell everyone what your, what your limits are. So there's a, a balance to be struck there. But at the end of the day, a uh, uh, democracy needs good transparency, and so that's the balance to be struck. And this is where localism comes in. If you don't like the way your councillors are doing, with all due respect to John and his team here, but this is a general proposition, if you don't like the way your councillors are doing the job, then the solution arrives, or the performance review arrives, every three years. Thank you. Okay, the next question we've got here is for the uh, Swiss Ambassador, Sir David Montessor. Can you please explain how the current Swiss immigration policy supports local communities? I think actually following on from that one is the next question, which is how does Switzerland allow or not allow foreign ownership of land?
somebody's made the observation that everyone here is old, and uh, they're asking the question, how do you involve youth? How, how might we involve youth in, in, in localism and local government? Uh, I, well, there's a number of ways, um, really. I mean, I, I attended a conference, this was Malta was on as well, a couple of weeks ago in Wellington. We had 1,300 young people around the country um, uh, there, and I was on a panel with uh, Sylvester Chloe Schwalbeck, who's the youngest MP, um, and, um, and uh, we, we, I, I talked through this concept, and the basic thing I said, and the power's in your hands. You know, young people don't vote in local government elections. They rarely vote general elections either, and they were moaning about everybody else voting, and I said, frankly, get involved, use your vote, and, 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 uh, and, and so on. So we, we're looking to engage with as many young people, because we need the young to engage in democracy, because they're the future of it. If they don't see the value in it, we've got a long-term issue, so we need to make it relevant for them. That means, and then they have a point of view about coming through. We also have a, our own group inside LGNZ called Young Elected Members. You actually have to just be younger than 40. That sort of says something about the demographic. Uh, but, um, so we're going to try to fix that too. But we're, we're involving them. But we, you know, so there's a number of mechanisms we can do to get into that. The goal is we're looking to in, um, um, involve everyone, uh, Māori, uh, uh, power, you name it. At the end of the day, democracy is owned by everybody, not just particular. But look, youth have a particular um, uh, target for us, and, and at the fitness uh, uh, for the future, or what that was called, they, you know, they, it, it was about uh, the issues for them were things like long-term climate change, all those sorts of things, social development, educational policy, that sort of thing. Those are intergenerational, so they have they have an interest in the outcome of the decisions that make now. So, just simply stating that reality involves them, and they and, and giving them the power to. To, to engage and to make decisions is the way forward. And that's actually localism. Thank you. And uh, next one can do it as a double banger if you like. So what, what is the biggest barrier in moving to a localism model? And does local government New Zealand consider or is local government New Zealand considering a trial on localism and what might be the time frames? So on the, on the issue of, um, of trial, um, we haven't got a fixed view because we're starting the process, but look, I'm never a big fan of Big Bang. You know, that, that's always, there's high, uh, a lot of risk. People will get very nervous about that sort of stuff. So there may well be a good case to trial this in some areas. I, 
Um, but remember, if it's trialled, it's the, it's, the, it's the upside and the downside if you regard accountability as a downside. You've got to deliver both. And it may be that it's um, better to trial things in some area. It may be that um, access to different ways of funding, for example, say a Queenstown local accommodation levy or a local uh, uh, consumption tax or local income tax. Bear in mind, one of the bottom lines here is we can't raise the overall tax burden for the country. So if we locally want to do more, that means the central government's going to do, give up less. And you know, there's a debate with the Treasury to be had. But, um, but um, it may be that there's gateways you go through. When you establish certain credentials in terms of do things and have confidence that you get through there. But so we're up for it all. But a but a but a targeted pilot may have utility in my view, um, and it may be in a particular area. So take the social policy side, building off the previous social sector trials. Well, actually, let's reinvigorate that. That was uh, I think Mr. English's idea, um, and then um, then stopped for a variety of reasons. But maybe let's reinvigorate again and see if that works. See if perhaps unemployment issues can be dealt with better locally than through the um, through the century, those sort of things. And, it, okay, that works. Well, what about this? And what about that? And then you can build it. So, you know, we're talking about um, a, a thing that's 150, 100, well, you know, 170 years of our history. It's not going to be reversed next Tuesday. So we've got to take this in a considered and professional and mature way. And at the end of the day, remember, the people of New Zealand have got to see the value in it. Can't be imposed from the top down. Great, thank you, and thank you for all the questions tonight. We are uh, out of time for the questions. If your question hasn't been answered, if you'd like to come up afterwards and uh, pop your email address on your question, we'll ensure that we get uh, the answer out to you by the, by the end of the week. So it's uh, my duty to uh, now welcome our Mayor, uh, John Booth, to the stage just to give uh, some thanks. Fantastic to see you all here tonight. This is a really good turnout because this is something I think we're all going to have to look at grasping. And uh, being in the role of a mayor, uh, I see everything that our guests have talked about tonight. So I, I've been told to be very brief. So um, Oliver, I had um, Oliver speak down at the local government conference in Christchurch um, not long a month ago. And um, I had a conversation with him down there, as many others did. And what we're seeing here tonight is not actually just only Cardiff. It's a, it's a conversation being had around New Zealand by many, many people. And that's quite exciting, actually. So, Olive, thank you very much um, for being coming to the wonderful place of Canada. And uh, we're a very proud community. We're a very involved community. And, um, and that's what makes it really special. Um, Ambassador Vogel Sanger, get that right, David? Uh, it is an honour for our community to have um, a, another country's ambassador here in Cardiff. Uh, it's very special, and um, as a mayor, um, I feel really honoured to have you here. Uh, I treat you all the same, but we don't get many people um, at that level, and uh, so it's, it's great to have you here. I really appreciate what you had to say. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting your head around it, because it's very new. But little things are starting to drop into place, and I think that's the benefit we have um, from having you, you here this evening. So thank you very, very much for coming up from Wellington uh, this evening and being with us. My learned friend across the road there, Malcolm. Um, I have great respect for Malcolm. I see Malcolm uh, all around the countryside at uh, different events that we go to um, as mayors and councillors in other areas. Um, when Malcolm speaks at a conference, Normally you can hear a pin drop. Because people like to hear what well, I especially do. I like to hear what Malcolm has to say, and many others do. Um, when Malcolm came to Chief Executive of Local Government New Zealand not that long ago, I'm not sure what year was it, Malcolm? Yeah. Um, huge change. Huge change in attitudes. Uh, and Malcolm brought a whole new dimension to what is happening in Local Government New Zealand. And I see what he is talking about here tonight as the next step as we think about how we can make it better and how we can all serve our communities better and as the communities can be involved uh, back with, with us. So thank you very much um, for the, um, being here this evening. We really appreciate it.
John. So it's my pleasure to close the meeting. Thank you all for attending. So without you, we couldn't have put on this particular event. So we'd love you to continue the conversation over a cup of tea and coffee at the end. And finally, I'd like to ask all to put our hands together to thank our guests for coming up to Cardiff.